blood spilled on battlefields all over the world is being replaced by a dramatic supply system. At Naples, the 15th Medical General Laboratory, only base unit of its kind in the Mediterranean theater, was established in January 1944 to supply the great need for whole blood, whose early use in counteracting shock and hemorrhage is even more important than blood plasma. There's no scarcity of depositors in this blood bank. Frontliners and those in forward areas know with the Army Medical Department that whole blood and blood plasma are the foremost lifesavers of the war. And with major sacrifices so close by, everyone wants to make this minor sacrifice. Donors are first checked for disease, colds, rashes, anything which might damage the quality of their contribution. Once okayed and typed, they're ready to do their share to save a life. A little Novocaine injected first makes the bleeding needle feel like a feather tip. And the only thing donors feel after this is a personal participation in the war. To prevent damage to the blood from splashing, the vacuum collecting bottle is inverted. While donations are being made, a medical officer is present at all times and frequent personnel checks are made. Donors are mostly rear echelon soldiers and base section troops, along with transient Army and Navy men many of whom received this bank's blood themselves after being wounded and are now repaying the loan. Even convalescent patients like to get back on these cuts. But whether dog face or whack, sailor or flyer, all are red cellmates. In this work, there are no separate arms. The only arm that counts is the arm that gives its life-saving blood for someone else. And in this work, all blood is the same color and the same quality. While the donor rests after giving blood, a technician takes his or her pint to the laboratory for processing. All rubber tubing, valves, and needles used to draw the blood are taken to the washing room. Tubing is drained into a test tube, and the sample is put aside for further testing. The apparatus is then sterilized and reassembled. Meanwhile, a small pilot bottle containing another blood sample is attached to the pint bottle for further cross-matching tests in the field just before use. From now on, the whole blood must be kept refrigerated at all times, lest it deteriorate. Even so, at this base, it's considered worthless after seven days. The blood samples are next taken to serology, where they receive a number of tests before their matching refrigerated bottles are sorted, tagged, and shipped. Many of these involve blood serum, and to prepare this, the samples are placed in a centrifuge, which separates the serum from the blood cells. One of the most important tests is the con test for syphilis. Without getting technical, this includes an analysis of the clear serum of the blood. At blood collecting stations all over the world, these same tests are conducted. This station isn't an indication that the people at home are falling down on their job of donating whole blood. There are five centers on the west coast and five on the east supplying whole blood. But since it's highly perishable, and since it's impossible for the armed forces to tell how much they will need from day to day, it's been found better to depend in part on overseas units for supply. After a thorough run of the specimen, the contests are read and recorded. Another important test is for blood grouping. Drops of known A, B, and O cells are mixed with the donor serum to determine correctness in grouping. Wrong grouping may result in the death of a patient for it makes the cells clot. Blood titer, that is the concentration of clotting factors, must be tested also, since mixing bloods of high and low titer may be dangerous. Only type O is accepted for whole blood transfusions because it's a universal type which may safely be administered to any patient. Blood smears are also closely examined for malaria. After these various tests, the bottles are taken to a topping room which is guarded against dust particles. Here, they are checked against the test reports, and all rejections are weeded out. Capped, each bottle is punctured with a sterilized needle, and a dextrose and saline solution is added to preserve the blood and prevent the breakup of red cells. Now properly labeled, final sorting starts. 
high titer blood is set aside, distinctively tagged, and as a further check against error, these bottles are stored separately. Then back to the icebox again to await that trip up front. And that's not long. These bottles are used as fast as they're filled. The allied demand for them is great, for smashing the powerful armies of our fascist enemies is bloody work. At the time for shipment, bottles are transferred from the big refrigerators to insulated wooden boxes. These boxes, incidentally, were improvised largely from parts of abandoned enemy equipment. The boxes are then loaded into a refrigerator truck and taken to waiting planes. Speed of the courier plane service is the most vital factor in the successful use of whole blood. And its reliability under all hazard is one of the war's great documents of man's effort to help man. The air crews perform a stirring job in delivering the blood. During rapid advances, locations of frontline hospitals often change quickly, and the crews must be prepared to land transports at alternate fields. Weather doesn't stop them, and GIs sum up appreciation with the modest boast that the blood plane goes through even when the birds are grounded. Toward the end of 1944, these planes shuttled from Naples to central France, whence their cargo was trucked to the front. Victory had been bought with many casualties, and field hospitals needed whole blood desperately, as they will on every front, until all blood-spilling weapons are taken from every German and every Jap. These hospitals are just a couple of miles from where the flesh is ripped and the blood runs out. And here is where, as the wounded move back, the blood must move up. Time is short now, and the bottles must be quickly handled. And there must be enough of them, for a man might need eight or more pints before medics mend his shattered chest. But before even that, every bottle must be cross-matched, not only with the man's dog tags, but cross-matched with his own blood as a final check. There can be no mistakes here, for to use the wrong blood now would be serious. Untiring technicians label each tested bottle with the patient's name and untiring nurses take it away for immediate use. Here in the shock ward, where the first bottle of red-celled whole blood is given, a man really starts his big fight, the fight against shock, the fight for life. Here he gets a studied examination by the medics, and when his condition permits, he's moved around the corner into the operating tent, the bottle of life-saving fluid moving right with him. And even before the surgeons have rewashed their hands, a fresh bottle is in place. Now, not hearing the constant roar of nearby guns, but only a man's heartbeat, noble men and women can proceed with their noble work and make it avail because of whole blood and blood plasma. Without it, they have said, our mortality rate would double right on this table. With it, with this great stream of blood from a whack in Naples or a combat engineer, from millions of men in arms and from more millions of friends, relatives, workers at home, all races intermingle and flow into wounded men everywhere to bring them new life. B-24s are modified to expedite the use of chaff, best weapon against enemy radar detection devices. Chaff consists of thin metallic strips which are scattered from Allied bombers during operations over hostile territory. When enemy radar and ranging instruments probe for our planes, the chaff confuses and distorts the wave impulses on which radar instruments depend for accuracy. Chaff used to be dumped from the old open waste windows, but when modifications permitted firing with windows closed, group engineering of the 15th Air Force developed this chaff chute built into the plane's waste. Now the chaff is sucked out and scattered by the slipstream and with no further need to open a waste window, a gunner can operate comfortably and more efficiently, protected from freezing crop blasts on high altitude missions. And this again is a small but important example of how GI initiative brings benefit to the men themselves. C-97 is the Air Force's most advanced four-engine high-altitude troop transport, companion to the B-29. It has similar high performance, long range, and exceptional load carrying capacity. Designed and equipped for rapid loading and unloading, these operations require minimum effort, 
without the use of ground handling equipment. A folding drive up ramp is contained in the airplane, can be lowered or retracted in less than a minute. It's adjustable in width and slope to accommodate vehicles of various tread and height. Design permits unusual loading versatility. Many combinations of military cargo and personnel can be carried. Its useful load is 60,000 pounds. It can carry 134 fully equipped troops or 83 litter casualties or two light tanks with 500 gallon fuel supply plus 25 troops. In situations where time saving is an important factor, loading can proceed simultaneously at three different cargo compartments. With tie down equipment for rapid handling of preloaded pallets, a 20,000 pound load can be stowed in less than half an hour. For towing non-powered vehicles up the ramp and for load positioning inside the fuselage, an electrically powered cargo hoist operates the full length of the main cabin on an overhead rail. This Travis hoist is also used for extending and retracting the ramp. Through these rear cargo doors, 25,000 pounds of cargo in aerial delivery containers can be dropped in 20 seconds within the length of a 4,000 foot field. The release system is entirely automatic, each ADC cluster dropping as it reaches the proper position. The entire fuselage is pressurized to maintain 4,000 foot pressure up to 22,500 feet. Top speed at 15,000 feet, 345 miles an hour. Range, over 5,000 miles. Cabin is spacious and soundproof, and the exceptionally light control surfaces preserves the pilot's feel of the airplane. Pilots say this is a sweet airplane to fly. The C-97 is another great development of the home front, enabling us to carry the war right to the enemy's front door. A crippled Navy plane makes a spectacular landing on Moritai Island. In spite of a missing left tire, the pilot of this Ventura bomber comes in to land, wheels down. Anxious ground crews sweat the plane down as the pilot eases the right wheel onto the coral runway. The landing is perfect. The plane skids to a stop 220 yards down the strip. The slight veer is caused by the right tire bursting under the strain. Crash trucks race out against the possibility of fire, but the plane and air crew are safe. Damage is slight. Skilled ground crews will soon have the bomber back on patrol, flying to protect the light convoys against Jap submarines. Tenth Air Force P-47s carried out widespread attacks as Allied teamwork forced new Jap withdrawals in Burma. This strike on Mogok, enemy forward supply base, came on January 4th as hard-fighting Chinese troops battled to open the Lido-Burma route into China. The area was demolished and practically every building was set ablaze. On the same day, other 10th Air Force Thunderbolts flew against Mon Khat, north of Mogok, to drop 325-pound depth charges on camouflaged enemy troops and supplies. Allied pressure against the Jap was mounting rapidly. The day before, Akyab, the biggest Burmese port west of Rangoon, had fallen to British and Indian forces. And as the 10th Air Force continued to burn Jap installations, further enemy retreat seemed imminent. On January 10th, bomb-carrying thunderbolts struck at Borgio to wreck a railroad bridge over which Jap supplies were being moved. Direct hits with 500-pound general-purpose bombs tore up the bridge, tracks, and rail bed. This strike, to block movement of enemy reinforcements, came as Chinese troops closed on Nam Khan, Jap stronghold barring allied use of the Lido Road. Again on the following day, 10th Air Force fighters, in coordination with Chinese troops, attacked Konka. Japs defending the area were well entrenched. Battling Chinese troops were suffering heavy casualties. 
500 pounders and incendiaries rained on the enemy as P-47s bombed strong points and supply dumps. The same kind of teamwork occurred on January 14th when Jap forces stalled advancing British troops near Mabien. The air-supplied British column had been forced to rout out the enemy yard by yard in the stiffest resistance yet encountered in the campaign for Mandalay. The Thunderbolts used bombs and bullets to smash the concealed bunkers from which the Japs were fighting. By week's end, close inter-allied cooperation had further buckled the enemy's position in Burma. Nam Khan was taken by Chinese troops. British and Indian forces continued their advance on Mandalay and 10th Air Force P-38s had smashed the Lushio Mandalay rail line, cutting off Jap forces in northeast Burma from a vitally needed line of supply and retreat. The following week, Thedor airstrip, 20 miles south of Mandalay, was blasted by 10th Air Force heavies. This raid on January 18th was made in conjunction with British ground forces closing on Mandalay from the north. 32 B-24s dropped 256 1,000-pound bombs to smash this vital enemy target. The Japs had been using Thedor as a fighter base from which to attack Allied ground troops and the air transports which supplied them. The bomb run was made at 6,000 feet. ACAC was light and only medium accurate. No plane was damaged. All week long, heavy bombers smashed at Jap airfields as advancing Allied forces gathered momentum. By the 21st, Chinese troops had stormed into the border towns of Wanting and Muse to clear the last of the enemy forces blocking the Lido Road route. As the Jap retreated south from Wanting, American troops of the Mars Task Force slashed at his flanks. The clearing of the Lido Road underlined Burma's importance as the gateway through which American supplies must flow from India to the China front and highlighted the giant task of the service troops upon whom movement of these vital supplies must depend. On the same day the Lido Road was opened, heavy bombers participated in the British invasion of Ramri Island. A pre-invasion barrage was laid along the coast by units of the British Navy. Eight minutes after landings began, 30 B-24s each dropped 52 100-pound fragmentation clusters on enemy strong points a mile inland from the beach. The attack, made in conjunction with British heavies, was extremely effective. The area was well covered with hits, and little enemy resistance was encountered afterwards by Allied landing forces. Seizure of Ramri Island, 50 miles south of Akyab, provides the Allies with a base for airfields flanking South Burma, and places the enemy's port at Town Goop in a precarious position. At January's close, the enemy situation steadily grew worse, as free Allied nations continued to strike powerful combined blows against Jap fascism wherever they could find it. Gunside aiming point cameras show versatility of our fighter tactics. Getting them right after takeoff is the kind pilots dream about. A Fokker Wolf 190 is closed to good range. This ME 109 is a piece of cake. RAF talk for a setup. Should never miss this kind. Another ME-109 is speared by good shooting and a 15-degree deflection shot. A Fokker Wolf 190 tries evasive action, but things get too hot for this Nazi. His bailout seems premature, but whatever his reason, these pictures give our pilot a clear credit for victory. A slow roll doesn't keep this Fokker Wolf 190 from being hit. Our pilot does a good job staying with him and gets him in the belly tank. Good shooting from above and behind. High deflection is tough, but it pays off. <laughs> 